Uh, just if you're a father here this morning, would you please just stand? We just want to recognize you. All right, amen. All right, in honor of Father's Day, I just wanted to, I know all you dads out there have your, your personal jokes, your dad jokes, your corny jokes you like to share. I just wanted to share a few, and I have no shape or form taking credit for these jokes either. Um, so what do sprinters eat before a race? Nothing, they fast. <laughs> Why do melons have weddings? Because they can't look. <laughs> Did you hear the rumor about butter? Well, I'm not going to spread it. <laughs> and how does a penguin build its house? He glues it together. <laughs> and my personal favorite off this list, and I don't know how all lawyers say goodbye, but how do lawyers say goodbye? We'll be suing you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to begin worship. We're going to sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit and Holy, Holy, Holy. You can remain seated.
you're welcome to come. We're not going to ID. We're not going to call you at the door when you come in. Um, we had a few last week that came to both services. So if you oversleep a little bit on Sunday, feel free to come to the 11th service. Like I said, we'll welcome you to either one. So we'll, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to come to your house, Lord, to worship you. Lord, I, I lift up all the fathers out there as we honor those today. Um, Lord, I, I just ask that you be with Brian as he brings us your word this morning, Lord, and just have a blessing on us this morning. All these things we ask and pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning to you again. And again, dads, happy Father's Day to you. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we get made fun of a lot, though. But it's a joy. It's, it's no joy like it. Mothers, there's nothing like being a mother. I give you that. But there's nothing like being a father either. And uh, God help us all to be the men that he's called us to be in our society and all around us. Well, there's uh, hope for us. There's help for us. His name is the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about him today. You know, in Matthew 28, the, the very end of the gospel there, Jesus, before he left this earth, gave his followers a mandate, gave his followers a great commission, we call it. And Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. We call that a, a Trinitarian form of baptism. It's an expression of our faith in the triune God as we baptize new disciples in Christ. Believers are to be baptized in the name that says the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity. You know, when you think about the Trinity, who can explain it? Who can explain the depths, who can reach the depths of the meaning of the Trinity? We can't. No Christian can. But to know the one true God is to know him as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. And where true Christianity is found, you will find expressions of the Trinity. Where those deny the Son, and where those deny the Spirit, or those deny the Father, that's not true Christianity. You know, we sing, and we sang it a while ago, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to you. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And we're going to talk about that third person in the Trinity. The Apostles' Creed, we find a phrase, it's just six short words, but it's six powerful words. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Very simple statement there about our belief. And, but they remind us of our continual dependence on the Holy Spirit. You and I, if the Holy Spirit were to remove his presence from us, where would we be? How would we stand? How could we continue in this life? So few of us today have much familiarity with the teachings about the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you want the, last week I gave you a 50 cent word, I'll give you a 50 cent word again today. Pneumatology. It's the study of the Spirit. Alright? So you can go home and impress your friends and your family and your neighbors and you, you learn something today. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said in John 16, 7, this is Jesus in the middle of comforting his disciples giving his disciples instructions about, hey, guys, I'm about to leave. I'm going away. They didn't understand all that. They couldn't quite grasp what Jesus was talking about, but he made this statement in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, does anybody else just think this is a shocker? This is a very shocking statement that Jesus makes here. What he's saying is it's better 
to have the Holy Spirit present among us than to actually have the physical presence of Jesus Christ. That's shocking what Jesus says there. Now, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles if you brought it with you to John 14. John 14. We're going to look at just a few of the aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to leave, but I'm sending you the helper. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. What is he going to do? That's what we're looking at today. In John 14, verses 16 through 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. Now, one of the aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he abides with us and in us. We'll talk about what that means. Without God, we have no hope. Without God, we have no real life. The fear of being left behind without Jesus, I'm sure, gnawed at the hearts of the disciples. Now, you think about it. We've all had friends. We've all had maybe a neighbor, a relative that was going to move away, far away, and you weren't going to see them again, maybe for a long time. Do you remember how that just tugged at your heart? You didn't know what, really what to say. You didn't know what to do, but it just gnawed at you. I'm sure that's what the disciples felt as Jesus was trying to explain to them, hey, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm sending the helper to you. This promise that he gave to the disciples extends to us. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ receives the Holy Spirit, receives the helper into your life. He gave us these eternal words of comfort and saying that the Holy Spirit would come to us. And not only would the Spirit come, he said, but the Spirit would dwell with his disciples. But he goes deeper than that. Not only did he say the Spirit was going to come and dwell with his disciples, he was going to dwell in his disciples. So go all the way back to the Old Testament. All the imagery of the sanctuary, the imagery of the tabernacle and the temple, all pointed to this one event when Jesus said the Holy Spirit is going to come and take up residence in your very life. He's going to, you're going to be the temple of the Spirit. The intimacy of a believer and it, between the believer and the Spirit, that's described in the Bible as abiding. Jesus says he's going to abide with you. What does the word abide mean? It means to remain, to continue, to stay, to dwell, reside in, to continue in a particular relationship. You can look those up in Webster. That's what abide means. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to remain with you. He's not going to go away. He's going to continue in you. He's going to take up residence in you. And you're going to continue in this particular relationship forever. Now the Spirit himself, the third member of the Trinity, abides in you. He abides in me and in all who belong to Jesus Christ through faith. The, the Spirit's ministry of abiding in us fills us with hope fills us with security. How is it that we can face the things we have to face each day? How is it that we can look at the, the news channel and say, my God in heaven, what a mess we're in. What hope do we have? There is no hope in government. There is no hope in human systems. All hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit that he sent to us who dwells with us. And as the Spirit abides in us, the full presence of God is with us. You understand that? There, there's never a time where we're apart from God. The Holy Spirit is the explanation. Uh, you look down through the ages. How many attempts, how many tries people tried to stamp out the church? People tried to get rid of the Word of God. But they fail every time. What's the explanation? The only explanation is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit explains how we can hear the words of the Bible itself and understand its meaning. You see, the very fact that we're Christians, the very fact that we're saved, means that the Holy Spirit would draw uh, our hearts to Christ and the relationship with Him. Jesus promised here the Spirit as an abiding presence forever. And that's great comfort for us. 
Now look at John 14, verse 26, where we see the Spirit not only abides, but he also teaches. Jesus says, but the Helper, and he defines the Helper here, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, as, G as the disciples had to come to terms with the fact that Jesus was going to leave them, that they weren't going to have the physical presence of Jesus with them anymore, they felt the pain of losing their beloved teacher. He was going away. What's going to comfort them? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to teach you. He's going to be your teacher. The Spirit of God will come on all those who believe in Christ and teach all things and bring to mind all things through what? Through his inspired word. What Jesus spoke audibly and demonstrated for his disciples, the Spirit was going to come and reteach that. He was going to reemphasize that. He was going to cause the disciples to remember it. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, some of them wrote these things down, and we have them today. And God be praised for it. The Spirit, Jesus ensured that his disciples would not suffer the loss of his teaching. You can imagine what that would have been like. You know, how are we going to remember this, Jesus? You gave us all these, these are words of life. Don't worry, guys. Don't worry, disciples. I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to cause you to remember. He's going to cause you be taught the things that I've taught you. The Spirit teaches all people of God through the Word, through the preaching of the Word. You know, if you look at just preaching, if I may do so just for a moment, preaching seems to be one of the most foolish things in all the world, right? I mean, if you, if you look at it just simply from a worldly perspective, it is it's out there, it's foolish. But from a godly perspective, and what he's called me to do, in particular to all pastors, preach the word. That means all the word. Not just the parts that we like, not just the parts we think about our favorites, but all the counsel of God that is given to us. We need the spirit, however, to help us understand what his word says. That's why so often worldly people, uh, non-believers, un-Christians, They'll look at the Bible and they'll mock it. They'll, they'll make fun of it. They, they don't want to have anything to do with it. It's because they don't understand. They have Jesus described and Paul the same way. These blinders are on their eyes. Satan has blinded their eyes to the truth. And unless the Spirit reveals the truth, we won't get it. This is what we call the ministry of the Word. The Bible itself is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You know that? It's a precious gift. The Bible is a living word because it's the word of God. And, and let us not neglect it. Never neglect the word of God. Third, we find in John 15, verses 26 and 27, the Spirit testifies. What does he testify about? Look at verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus revealed here that the Holy Spirit was going to come. He's going to abide with them. He's going to teach them. But he's going to testify. He's going to bear witness about Jesus. Jesus did not say that the Holy Spirit was going to come and he's going to testify about himself. He's going to testify about Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and he bears witness and he testifies about the work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit exalts the Son. It's one of those mysteries that we find within the Trinity where the Father is always pointing to the Son. The Son is always pointing back to the Father. The Holy Spirit is exalting the Son and the Father. It's just what has been described down through the ages as the divine dance, this relationship in the Trinity. But this is also a reality check for churches worldwide. Any church where you find um, the Spirit of God present and active, you do not find so much a testimony about the Holy Spirit as you do testimony about what Jesus is doing. 
where you find a bold and a biblical and enthusiastic and a joyful and a life-changing uh, testimony of Christ in the church, there you can be sure that the Holy Spirit is active. So he testifies. And finally, the Spirit bears truth. This is in John 16, verses 13 through 14. Jesus says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit, will, when he comes, he's going to bear truth. He's going to carry the truth. In fact, the Spirit is truth. He, he is truth by definition. The truth, therefore, comes and dwells in and among believers in Jesus Christ. We live in an age that all but completely denies the existence of absolute truth. But you cannot get away from it. Truth, by very definition, is absolute. It's not relative. The Holy Spirit is the truth that comes and lives with us and in us and teaches us and abides with us and, and lifts us up and encourages us. You know what else? The Holy Spirit will never contradict himself. And the Holy Spirit will never contradict his own word. Now, we see this in practice in so many cases. And please be careful about saying this. God told me. You know what God told me this morning? You hear people say this. Well, what? Did he really tell you that? Or is that something you just made up? I'll tell you an example of that. You know Benny Hinn? Y'all don't watch Benny Hinn. I'm glad that they, they are blank faces. Now. Good. I'm glad. Because he's out there. One morning he, he was on television and he got in front of his audience and he said, You know what the Holy Spirit said to me this morning? Yes, his, his exact words. Do you know what the Holy Spirit said to me this morning? There's not three persons in the Trinity. There's nine persons in the Godhead. Now, he went on and explained what he was talking about there. Later on, he was interviewed, and that person asked him about it. Now, you said here, the Holy Spirit told you, there's not three persons in the Trinity, but nine persons. And you know what he said? Yeah, that was a really foolish thing for me to say, wasn't it? But he already said the Holy Spirit told him that. Be careful. The Holy Spirit will never contradict his word. He'll never contradict the truth. Be careful. The Holy Spirit calls us to the truth of God and to his will for our lives. Who is the one drawing us back to God? Who is the one drawing us and pushing us and prodding us to do God's will? So often it's not us. If we're left totally up to us, we're, we're going to stray every time. But the Holy Spirit keeps calling us back to the Father, back to Christ. Now, remember, Jesus himself also said, the Spirit it will set you free because the truth will set you free. All right? What is the application for us this morning? As Christians, we must live our lives in the Spirit. Okay, do you ever think about that? You wake up in the morning you're like, Spirit, what, what do you want me to do today? What, where are you going to take me today? As Christians, we must set our minds on things that are above. There, there's so much stuff out there and so many things trying to grab your attention and grab and grip your heart. But what are we supposed to do? Look at the things that are above, not the things that are below we must kill sin and pursue holiness in our lives. We cannot even hope to put sin to death unless we rely on the Spirit to do it for us. We can't do it. We can't fix our lives, but He can. We will fail every test. We'll give away to every temptation in our lives. We'll falter before the enemy unless we cry out to the Spirit for His help, His strength, and His power to guide us and fill us uh, so that we can endure in this life. And we must cultivate this relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's not 
it's, the relationship's not just going to be automatic. You can't set yourself on autopilot and just think everything's going to be great. Now, he does the work, but you have to have a relationship with him. Seek him out. Be in his word. Spend time in prayer. Fellowship with other believers. And I encourage you to walk by the Spirit. There are several places in Paul's letters. He directly tells the church, walk by the Spirit. You know what he's saying? Live your life by the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Know Him and meet with Him daily in His Word and through fellowship in the church and depend on the Holy Spirit to bear fruit in your life. You know He wants to do that? If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be bearing fruit, spiritual fruit <coughs> in your life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about that, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control. These are the things that define Christians. These are the things when the world looks at us, that's the picture they're supposed to see. Is it? I hope that it is. I believe, the, the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we come to you thanking you for your involvement in our lives, for taking up residence in our hearts. Lord, for dwelling with us, for drawing us to Christ and to bringing us into the relationship with the Father. On this Father's Day, we especially thank you for the gifts of fatherhood in our lives, the lessons and the memories and and Lord, they're all gifts from you because you are the Father. Lord, help us to, to live our lives in such a way that, that we will bear that fruit, that the Spirit's working in us, through us. Lord, that we will be uh, people called by your name, people living by your uh, hope and faith that you give to us. Lord, that we can live boldly in the face of all opposition because you are God. And as we so often sing, we are victors because there is victory in Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. We want to say that we love you. And the only reason we can say that this morning, Lord, is because you first loved us. And may we bless you, Lord. May we honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll do the same way like we did uh, last week. If uh, you need to stick around and talk to me or ask for prayer, I'll be up here and uh, waiting for you. But if not, we'll be dismissed with a, prayer, with a closing prayer. Father, as we go out these doors, we ask that you remind us that we're on your mission field. Lord, the things and the people that you put in front of us help us to see the opportunities and use them to redeem the time for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you.